Hey guys, uh, welcome back to Stories of Significance. Today we are humbled to be hosted by Cool Beans in Nyali. It is hosted at Danka Plaza. Uh, feel free to join in and uh, see what they have on the menu for you. And today I am honored to host none other than my good friend and mentor, uh, Madam Nora Zige of Zetu Events. Thank you so much, I, Vincent. I really look forward to hearing more about your story and okay. learning from you. But just to kick us off, could okay. you tell us who you are? Thank you so much, Vincent, for the invitation to come here uh, for uh, Stories of Significance. Uh, my name is Nora, Zetu, Nora Zige Mwangima. I am the proprietor of Zetu Events. Zetu Events is an events organizing company and also we do supply for other event organizers in, this, uh, in the events industry. I've been doing this business since the year, officially from 2012, that is when I registered Zetu Events. And uh, we are based here in Mombasa, but we also do events outside the county of Mombasa. So, um, yes. so far you've just shared about Zetu Events. Yes. So I'm wondering, mm -hmm. who, who are you? in terms of um, where you were born, where you grew up, okay. what are your values? Um, yeah. Are you a family woman okay. or should I call you a lady? Yeah. And um, yes, maybe you could give us a little bit of a background about your childhood okay. and a little bit about into your value system and what guides you to be who you are to. Okay, I am a firstborn to uh, my father and my mother. My father is called Mr. Paul Muranga Mwangima. And uh, my mom is the late Priscilla Wakio. I'm the firstborn. We are five siblings. Um, I would say that uh, growing up, um, of course, in any African setting, growing up, there's a lot of challenge and a lot of expectation, especially for the first girl, for the first child. And uh, I was always... Um, always a good a good girl always uh, expected to perform the best so i did my part i used to be very good academically i excelled i went to a national school the moral girls school i passed with a b plus and then i went to Egerton university i did um, a course called ctid uh, clothing textiles and interior design and excelled with a first class honors Wow. And then, Congratulations, yeah, Thank class. you so much. Thank you so much. First class owners are here today. Yes, yes, we are here. We are here to tell you that you can have a first class owners and come back and, and grind and hustle and, and start your company and rise to, uh, to the skies. Yes. Yeah, so basically, that is my story. Um, maybe I can start from my values. I'm yes. a Christian. I'm a born again Christian and I'm a married woman. I'm married to one man. You know, I'm a woman a female woman uh -huh. married to a man who is a male. You know, nowadays there's a lot of confusion <laughs> going on in the, yes. in the world. Uh, people are noting other things that, uh, other trends that are coming up. But let me say this on, uh, straight, that I'm a Christian, I'm born again. And God has been the center of it all. I can all say that it is about God. My journey and even from how I started my business mm -hmm. and up to where I am right now, it has been about God. Yeah. Yes. So you are a firstborn. And what is it like being a firstborn mm -hmm. um, and a lady? Yes. I don't understand. I'm a firstborn, but I'm a man. Okay. But what is it like to be a firstborn and you are a lady? And um, you're likely, ladies, I hear, mm -hmm. I have not confirmed, yes. they tend to be, you know, the father's kids. Mm -hmm. So is there, how is it like, what is the environment like? And okay. how has it shaped you mm -hmm. to the woman that you are today? Okay. Uh, I think being a firstborn is a very big responsibility. There's a lot of pressure involved in being a firstborn because the, the expectation of parents and the expectation of people around you, even other extended family members is very, very high. As I was, as I was saying, when, from when I was a young girl, <clears throat> my dad always used to expect that I excel in school because my dad is an academician. Yeah. He's been a teacher all through until his retirement. So there was a great expectation of, on performance. You know, you have to be <clears throat> number one, you have to be top 
three, top ten, you have to be this and that. So there's that responsibility, even from us when I was a young kid, that was on me that I have to be the best. I remember when I cleared uh, high school and I got a B plus, I used to tell my mom that if I get a course that um, I've not, I don't like doing, I would not like to do, then I would not go to university to do it. That time, I didn't like being a teacher because I kept seeing my parents going through all those motions. You know, those times teachers used to be, we used to feel as if they're being mistreated. Every time they keep on striking, they, yeah. they're fighting for their rights. So I never admired being a teacher. So I remember I told my mom, if I get a teaching course, I will not go to university to do a teaching course. I will just go and do a diploma somewhere else. Then one, I remember one thing she told me. She told me, no, you cannot do that because your baby sister will never understand as to why you didn't go to university yeah. and yet you qualified for it. So the weight of responsibility in a firstborn is, is, is a lot. Then um, in the year 2002, I lost my, my lovely mom. And that is when actually the weight of being a firstborn was tested on me. I felt like as if my world has had come to an end. I felt everything had crumbled on me. It was dark. There was no way because I kept looking back and, and at my siblings. That time, um, the, my, my brother, our second born, we were together in Egerton with him. He just joined first year. My, my, our third born uh, sister, was in high school going to do her KCSE, our fourth born bro. He was uh, doing his KCPA and our baby sister was only 10 years old. That time she was only in class four. So I kept wondering, God, how are we going to make it? How, how, what will happen to us? Yeah. You know, because our mom was like a pillar, of, uh, a pillar of strength to our family. And yeah. she's the one who used, we used to depend on her for everything, you know, because, you know, in African home setups, you know, the fathers are always like the king. They are there. <laughs> you, you only approach them like when you have a great need, which, which, it's like the way you hear in the Bible, yeah. you, the, the queen used to be given a golden scepter for you, for her to even approach the king. So that is how our fathers portrayed themselves. But um, if, uh, through the loss of my mom, I had to raise up to the occasion. And I remember one thing I told myself. I told myself that um, I am married. I told myself that I will not get married until I see my siblings, all of them finish school, and have good jobs and they're doing well. And I think sometimes we are told our own words can become prophecies. And actually, yes. I feel that is almost what happened to me. Yeah, so... Um, so did it actually happen? Yes, it happened. It happened. By the time I was getting married in 2013, mm -hmm. all my siblings had cleared school. Our last born was actually doing her last paper. The day I was doing my wedding, after that, the following week, she was actually going to finish her last paper in medical school, and she did not struggle to get a job. She got a job immediately. So I would say that um, being a firstborn has shaped me to be a leader because I feel naturally you tend to be a leader because the expectation on you is high. Yeah. Um, I, I, I am a self, um, self. How, how do I put it? I think I, I, I make decisions easily and I follow through them without being uh, followed. followed. Up. Yes, followed so up. Actually, the, the right word is that you yes. have personal initiative yes. and personal accountability. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So uh, that is that is who I am. And I'm also passionate about young people and reaching out to the women. That is one of the things that I know I am, I'm really passionate about. And in that case, um, I've, I've, I've mentored quite a number of women and youth could be around 100 in number. I love one-on-one -on -one mentorships more than group mentorships because one-on-one -on -one mentorships, I tend to, to draw out the strength in each person that I meet. And I, when I say mentorship, I do it in my work. I do it at my work. I usually give opportunities to women. I give opportunities to young people to work in my company. And then when they, when they are there, I see what their strengths are and I try to draw them out. Yeah. I teach them values. I teach them uh, my, my beliefs. I'm a Christian. I, I don't teach them my beliefs and impose on them, but they clearly know. where they, how, When they come to work for me, they know who I am. They know my beliefs and they know my standards. I also push them to be excellent in mm -hmm. terms of production. In fact, I usually say that I have two personalities. When I'm at work, I'm more masculine than feminine. When I'm in social circles, I'm very 
I'm very feminine, I'm very uh, introverted. But when I'm at work, I have another personality. I am very uh, pushy and I'm very aggressive. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people might even not understand me. And most of the times I tell people who work for me, please, when I laugh with you, when we are talking about other things and everything, don't confuse it. Because when I change to this other personality that I am, I am very forceful and I'm very pushy because I want to see my company reach somewhere. I want to see the vision that I have for my company reach somewhere and excellence. I believe in excellence in whatever I do. Even if it's the smallest jobs, if it, yeah. even if it is draping, can you do it with excellence? Even if it's flower arrangement, can you, them, can you do them with, with excellence? If it's ironing linen, can you do it with excellence? That is one of my mantras, yes. And by the way, I think this is the place where I thank you for uh, doing the decor for my book launch. Okay, thank you. Uh, last year on April. Yes, it was but a great let's pleasure. Go, let's go back a little bit. Okay. I... Listening you speak, I feel like I am inspired to ask this question, yes. which is off the script. Mm -hmm. Is it that mm -hmm. firstborns mm -hmm. end up being parents mm -hmm. when they actually need a parent? I think I think it is true. <laughs> I think most of the times um, I've had it. I've had it said, and I've also read it written that. Um, uh, firstborns are deputy parents yeah. because most of the times as you're growing up you're always told oh okay take care of this uh, your siblings i'm going like maybe your mom could be could be leaving to the market or to work even if it's a weekend you're given responsibilities from a young age yeah. you're told take care of your siblings do this and do that you see so naturally you you tend to be a parent to your your siblings they will keep run they, will, they keep coming to you for strength some verbally and some emo verbally and non-verbally. For me, I know, I look at my siblings, I, and most of the times I can tell, oh, um, especially for the my brothers, most of the times they would not even talk to me about a certain issue, but I would know this one is trying to communicate this way by the way, the, how they are behaving, or even by how maybe they are chatting to me. So I would know, and I would I would want to 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 parent them. I would want to shield them. I had a great challenge when we we lost our mom. My emotionally and psychologically, I I became a mother to them, whether they know it or not. But for me, I became a mother to them. Yeah. And I would not be able to settle, even in life, I would not be able to do so many things because I always used to, to live like an opening for them. So in case anything happens to them, I always used to accommodate them and protect them. There was a lot of that. They are grown-ups now. Everyone, there's no one who is under 30, right? Yeah. Now, um, Okay, our last born is going to be turning. Yeah, she's already uh, 30. She's already 30. So imagine even from the time that uh, our mom left, I've always felt like I needed to protect this. I needed to make sure that they are safe. I needed to make sure that uh, they, they, they are getting what they needed in life. Because most of the times you find that the emotional... Um, the emotional beat that you get from your mom, sometimes when it's removed, it leaves the children very confused. So I was always there for them to make sure that their lives, they would not miss anything. And I hope that they are grateful for that part that I did. Yes. yes now, yes. Let, let me take the question a little bit deeper. Yes. Now, when you needed a parent, yes. you've been forced yes. intentionally yes. or unintentionally. Yes consciously or unconsciously yes. to become a parent. Yes. Now, does this affect mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. going forward, mm -hmm. especially in relationships? Because it reaches a point where mm. there is also a gap in you yeah. that you didn't have someone mm. who wants to protect you, mm -hmm. somebody who cares about your welfare. Mm. I don't know if it has a ripple effect mm. to you mm. that when you needed a parent, mm. you were actually a parent. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience on the same? No, for me, luckily enough, I would say I thank God for the support system that I received from my aunties on both my mom's side and my dad's side. They came in and really helped. So I used to draw strength from them. Actually, um, I would shield my siblings, but when things are crumbling, I would run to them. Yeah. Most of the times I would run to them. They would shield them. They will help me. They would advise me. I remember... <laughs> This one, I would say, I, I, I've never told anyone, but even, okay, on screen, maybe I can say it, I don't know. Um, but it reached a point where you feel like your life is actually crumbling. 
I think maybe even at some point I could have nursed uh, mild depression, but I didn't know. One thing I know about me is that whenever I feel that I'm reaching my elastic limit, I always draw back. Yes. I always draw back and I go back to myself and go deep down within myself and I start now dealing with my own issues. That is how I, I do it. That is how I do life. But um, I remember in the year 2007, the pressure was so much. Mm. Whenever I go home, I see things are not, um, some things are not very, very, very going well. Uh, that is the time that my other siblings are in college. I remember our second last born was in um, Mombasa Poli. He had just joined and you know, he needed financial support. Our youngest uh, uh, sister was still in high school. There was a lot of pressure and there was a lot of shifting. So the, the demand for me, I kept feeling was high. See, so sometimes you keep feeling that you have this tongue of war within yourself. But one thing I know, what I usually do, I always go back to myself. I draw away from every everyone and everything. And then I go deeply down within myself. And I also rely a lot on God. That is how I have been able to overcome. I really rely on God. And then also I told you I have a support system. I had yeah. my aunt, may God rest her soul. We lost her last year. She was a great support system. She she offered now the bit that my mom would have offered. So yeah. whenever I had a challenge, somehow I would just call her and tell auntie this 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 is going on in my life. I have also a sister to my dad who is also who, who took us in also. She really shielded us and, and just and just uh, helped us, you know, through those dark seasons and deep, deep, very, very tough seasons. Huh? Because uh, let me tell you, if you lose a parent, whether it is your dad or your mom, it changes you completely. The trauma that comes with it, because this is something that happens and you have no experience of, no one prepares you because my mom was very okay. She was well, she was doing okay. And then all of a sudden we encompass and we are told, mom is gone, you know. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it, it, it was so sudden and, and so traumatizing. So the ripple effects of that, I thank God that there, there were people who, who were there to actually offer us support. And my own father, my father had been a pillar of strength. Not even one time did my our father uh, leave us and say that he, he has abandoned us. He yeah. has been a pillar of strength. He's been someone we can run to and talk to. He's been praying for us. You know, as a man, man, the men offer different kind of a support system. Yeah. They may not offer the emotional support, but that that's their presence. And him, when I call him or when I talk to him and he tells me that God is going to do this, you are okay. My daughter, things are going to look up for you. That, that one, I really thank God for my dad also. He has been a support system. He's been there for us all through. He never abandoned us at all. In fact, if there is anything, he's always supporting us and he's always shielding us. Yeah, he loves us very much. Much. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Um, I, I don't know what to add to that, okay. but maybe to later at what you've said that sometimes when we feel we've lost ourselves, it's yes. important that we pause, yes. retreat, yes. you know, evaluate uh, right. where we've come from, mm -hmm. uh, where we are, and yes. where we are headed. And yes. then we are able a, either to eliminate some habits, some yes. environments, yes. and then we are able to relocate ourselves to where we actually want to go. Yes. And that's such a powerful thing mm -hmm. in, in a world where there is a lot of noise. Yes. There is noise in church. Yes. There is noise in social media. Yeah. There is noise in our friends. There is noise at the workplace. Mm. So I think the safest place mm. to be mm. is some moments of solitude. Yes. Some I moments think. of solitude. Yes. And nowadays it's underrated. Yes. If somebody feels painful, they retreat either to drinking, yes. they go to club, they mm. go to what. Mm. But then when do we spend time with ourselves? Yes. Uh, and I think that mm. is, uh, I, I actually mm. took time and wrote it in the first chapter of my book because yes. I felt like mm. we are so much into the noise yes. until we forget who we are. It's true. All right, really now, true. Let, let's move a little bit further mm -hmm. and we go to your career journey. Yes. Now you've completed campus. Yes. Uh, now, where did you go from there? Okay, I complete campus and I get into the job market with my CV that is loaded with all the qualifications. But then I came from a, a village school. So I would like to encourage those people who come from a village school. My primary school was called Mwatungi Primary School. <laughs> yes, Matunge Primary School, Ilinitunga. I went to a national school, Limuru Girls School. 
in quotes chokes. That yes. is where I went to. So reaching there, you find the cream de la cream of the nation. As we were, we, because we came from a marginalized area, um, <clears throat> you know, when, when children come from a marginalized area, they have um, even the, the, their grades. Yes. Their, perform, their marks are a bit lower than the ones who come from urban cities and where resources are available. So coming from a marginalized area and a small village school called Mwatungi Primary School, finding myself in Limuru Girls, you know, it's like a small fish going into a big ocean. Mm. And then from there, thank God, I worked very hard. I, I know when I put my, my, my mind, when I put my mind to something, I usually just focus on it until I excel. As I told you, like being a firstborn and having expectations over you by your parents, you know, like it, it, there is no way you would come, you'd go from a small village school and then you go to the Muru girls and, and you fail. Yeah. You know, you look back at your villagers are waiting. The society is waiting, and even your parents, they are all waiting, wondering, eh, we end up cool, eh? what are you going to give us? You know, so I had to work hard and just to, 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 to excel in my academics. And then I went to university. When I went to university, I never told you this story that the course that I had chose, I was called for. My dad never approved of it. So it was a bone of contention from year one until year four. Mm -hmm. Every semester we close school, we go home, he would sit me down and tell me, what are you going to be? What are you going to become? That was a very, also very difficult moment for me because he used to tell me, Nora, you are a bright student. He wanted me to change the course to biomedical science. Mm -hmm. So I remember that time when he was, I was taken by my both parents to, to campus. When they were leaving, they told me, Nora, make sure you change and you do biomedical science. But you know, I, I went back and looked, what do I want to become? What would make me feel happy and joyous as I'm doing? And I decided, no, I will do the course that I was called because I love designing. I love working with my hands. And so um, I sent my dad a letter that I had chosen, the course that I had chosen, that I was called for is actually what I'm going to pursue and not the biological science. Let me tell you, it was not an easy journey all those years. Every semester when it closes, before we open for the next semester, he would sit me down and ask me, what are you going to become? Mm -hmm. yeah? Your brains are supposed to be in sciences, you know, your performance, your marks. Now you have wasted all these science subjects that you excelled in. You are what are you going to become? And you know, in an African said, I want to bust this bubble. I want to, I want people to embrace, embrace a different kind of, uh, uh, perception in terms of careers. You know, most of the, our African parents, most of our parents expect people to get the mainstream jobs, becoming a lawyer, becoming a doctor, becoming a, a, a teacher, a nurse, you know, any, having those, uh, what are called, what, white collar jobs. Yes, right. Yeah, that, that is the expectation of most mm -hmm. parents. And it is not a bad expectation. But are we able to nurture our children's talents? Are we able to nurture our children's ability so that we can be able to embrace these other careers that have not, they, they don't seem to be white collar jobs, you know. Yeah. So from there, I had to excel. I remember one time before my mom passed away, I think she, I was now joining second year. She told me, my dear daughter, I want you to work so hard and prove your dad wrong. So you know what I did? I had, I did that thing. I worked very hard. I passed, I excelled and I got a first class honors. Now, no one prepared me for the job market. Yes. That was now another big challenge. When I cleared college, when I cleared campus, you go out there and you start looking for jobs. You know, you have your papers, those ones of university and those ones of where you have worked in attachment. And, you know, the job market is looking for people who can work. Yeah. Most of the times they would not even want to nurture small young talent or bring up abilities. They want someone who can actually produce. And then also there's another dilemma, and that is why sometimes I keep feeling we have to review this, our education system. Because after learning all those subjects and everything, someone still can come out of university and still don't know what you want to do. So immediately I cleared, I thought, okay, well, I think I'm interested in interior design because some of our college mates were pursuing interior design. So here I was, I started pursuing interior design, but I realized it's not in me, it's not my passion to do interior design. Um, as opposed to doing, because I love creating things. I love creating things for the moment. Yeah. 
I like creating, uh, transforming spaces, decorating. Actually, that is what I love doing most, more than interior architecture, like maybe building, painting, and those all those construction. So that was not in me. But when I cleared immediately, that is what I was pursuing because I could see my other friends actually pursuing that and they were doing well. Yeah. So there's that chasing after you other hope. people. Yes, I was copying other people. Mm -hmm. Then I went back to myself. I remember I looked for jobs. I was not getting a play here and a playing there. I went back to God. I was, I was like, God, if you don't come, you don't help me, I would not make it. I remember I even sold insurance. <laughs> I remember I sold insurance for Pioneer Assurance and uh, there was a time I went to a certain school and a headmaster chased me and I was like, God, I am better than this. I can't sell insurance. I'm not good at sales. Yes. That was, my, my personality is not so good at, at sales. I'm very good at production. So I went back to, 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 to myself and I went back to God. I told God, here, you have to make a way. You have to open a way for me because I don't know what to do, you know. That time, when I was still in campus, you know, sometimes when you're in campus, you get these small jobs of yeah. uh, going to do research, doing what, what. So there's a time I worked for a certain lady and she told me that uh, she is opening, she's interested in opening a, a, a wedding shop in Eldoret. Yeah. So she thought about because she, she had my CV. So she saw that I did uh, clothing, textile and interior design in the university. So she approached me with her partner. And they told me their vision and I was like, why not? Why not uh, take it? So I, I got that job in Eldoret. I was the head of uh, design. It was a very small shop, but I was the head of design in that place. Yeah. I used to design At least all I the... was the one yes, head, yes. apart from your normal head. Yes, and then <laughs> I, also, I was also the manager of the shop. Wow. Let me tell you, the opportunity that those ladies gave me Thank you, Phyllis, and thank you, Susan, for the opportunity you gave me to work for Elder Weddings. That is what now propelled me to actually have Z2 events because they gave me the opportunity to, expand, to, 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 to practice everything to do with business. Yeah. They gave me a space. It was a hardware, and we turned it around into a beautiful shop. We made a workshop and a display place. I was the marketing manager. I was the financial controller. I was, I mean, if I tell you I was the manager, you would think I was seated somewhere comfortably in an AC. It was not like that. Actually, mm -hmm. I did all the work for the shop from ground to up. I used to do all the marketing. You see, even um, those times, the government was not very strict. We would go and paste posters. I would actually personally work with the, with the, uh, we used to, 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 to mix. Yeah, uh, wheat, yeah, flour. Gum, uh, wheat flour, wheat flour, not gum. Gum was not expensive. You mix wheat flour with water and you move with a jar like this and you have your flyers and I go pasting all over the town of Eldoret. I would go from one estate to another, pasting and just marketing. I would visit shops, I would, I would visit churches, marketing our shop. So that one gave me a lot of experience. Um, my bosses would give me their money. They would give me an ATM. They tell me, write, write everything that is needed for this business. They give me the ATM. I go draw money. I would not even draw one single coin extra for myself. And I would put all the financial records right. And my salary that time was only 8,000 shillings. But I would not even be tempted to take any extra thing, any extra coin from that. Yeah. That faithfulness, that is what I had, you know. So... Uh, I worked there for two years, or around one year. The second year, I got an opportunity. I got one of, you know, when, when you clear campus, people drop your CVs, even your friends, they drop your CVs. So yeah. one of our friends had dropped a CV here in Mombasa at Tijan College of, of Design. <clears throat> so I received a call from the director of Tijan College. She asked me that she has seen my CV and my qualification. She would, she's interested in me being the principal in that college. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, here... Uh, my bosses, I tell you, they had already given me an offer that they want me to be a partner in their business, mm. not to be an employee. So to shift from being a, a, an employee to be a partner. And here now, another opportunity has come. Tijan College, the director calls me and she tells me that she wants me to be a principal at their college. And also they want to introduce interior design courses in the college. So she thinks that um, I would be one of, I would be an asset to that. Mm. Oh, I had to go and tell my, my, my bosses then. By then, they were becoming my friends. I told them that I've gotten this opportunity and I would like to, 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 to go for it. So they told me, no, it's okay. What you do, just bring in someone else. We, we interviewed so many people and we got someone and we left. Sir. 
so that they can be in charge. Meanwhile, this other side, I asked the director to give me a moment so that I can be able to, to resign and train someone else. So yeah. later on, I joined. In From head <laughs> yes. to principal. Yes, to principal of Tijan College. And also uh, we were teaching, we introduced interior design in that college. So I taught there for one year, I think for two years, around two years. But let me tell you something about me. I kept feeling there's this stirring. I felt that I am bigger than this. I, I felt that there's more for me than what I am doing. Yeah. You know, I used to have my own side business that I used to do when work closes. I used to stitch clothes. I used to love making clothes for people. Yeah. So <clears throat> I used to live with my aunt. I used to live with my aunt. Uh, my aunt. Uh, in the evening, immediately we close doors for the school. I would go to Marikiti, get fabrics and everything. Then I get to the machine. I stitch. I get. I, go, I used to get small, small orders. I stitch. Then in the morning, I wake up very early. By five, I'm already up finishing up clothes. By eight, I'm reporting to work. I mm. report to work, I do I everything. Nee, 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 nee. If you think at lunchtime, I used to go, if there's any material that I'm supposed to get and everything I get. So that's what I did for some time. Then I felt, no, this one is too strenuous. I got a small space in town <clears throat> and I got a fundi. I pushed our very fundi that we used to have in Eldoret <laughs> and I brought him <laughs> to Mombasa. So where I where Tijan was, it was on my Moy Avenue near Mapembeni. I got a small shop somewhere, an office I used to share with a lady, and they put that fundi there. So he used to work for us. But you know the dynamics of business like yeah. that. Sometimes the fundi does not work. There's work is not enough and everything, so it didn't work. But remember, there's this stirring that I keep feeling. I need to, I need to start my own work because I, I always used to feel that I'm I'm not. Uh, ex, uh, I'm not uh, putting my potentials out there so that yeah. I can experience. Uh, I can I can fully venture into it. So I decided no. Let me let me let me quit. But meanwhile, I used to get small small jobs like yeah. decoration. And I'm the kind that I taught myself even that decoration for weddings. I used to teach myself. I am very inquisitive, and uh, when I want to learn something, I will go all out and learn. So I taught I taught myself uh, even from when I was in Eldoret. So here in Mombasa, I always believe whenever I have an idea and I want money, I will ask, I will look for clients. Even if I'm not good enough, I will look for clients and I will do. It doesn't matter how long I will do that work, but I will do. That is how I used to do. I was not good in decoration. So my first job for decoration I got was, uh, I was still working at Tijan. I got uh, to decorate some boots for Ken India Insurance. And I remember... We did that booth for hours. We went there in the evening. I did the deco by 10 p.m. in the night. It was not done this well. I woke up very early in the morning. I finished a very small booth, only a three by three booth. See, but I was determined. I was like, I need to do this. This is what yeah. I am. I am passionate about. Then I did the flowers. The flowers even backfired. I didn't have a lot of contacts of florists and they, and then the budgets. That time we didn't know about costing. So you you undercoating. You get the job. If the flowers have come late. They are not okay. You start incurring other costs and then, but I, at the end of it all, I did and I presented. The next time, um, I think it didn't take me long before I resigned. I, mm. I told the director now. I think it's my. I, I feel. I need to venture out on my own and do my work. So I resigned from Tijan College. And I now, the, not, it was not Zetu Events at that time. It was called Zigen Designs. Yani, Zige, Nora. So you take Zige and then you put N. You know, that is, <laughs> that is, that, that is how I, I had called my venture, my hustles. Actually, I used to say those are my hustles. So that is how I began. I called myself Zigen. Then I thought, no, I think Zigen is too, too me. So what can I call it? I, I, yeah. I changed the name to Fable Creations. Fable means favor blessing. Yeah. So I called it favor blessing, Fable Creations. That's what I operated on uh, for some years. So we, 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 when I resigned, I had jobs ongoing. You know, like I had two orders of clothes stitching and I had a decoration job. Actually, there was a lot of pressure at that time because I was the everything. I used to be the one to design. I meet the clients. I design and I also stitch. I didn't have a, a tailor at that time. So I want to speak about now that beginning part. Remember, I resigned mid-month. 
meaning I didn't have a salary. I had a sewing machine and only two orders of clothes, two or an order for clothes and one for decoration. Yeah. So I just went in on all, all like that. When I finished these jobs, because it was like in the next two weeks, like a fortnight, then I finished. I came back to my senses. I came back to myself and I'm like, you know, I don't have a job. Have you ever trembled in your machine? Have you ever trembled wondering? And then month end is coming. Remember, I, I forfeited my salary. The jobs that I was given to do, already I had consumed the deposits, you know, the deposit and everything. And probably you underquoted as well. Of course, underquoting and everything. And then remember at that time also, I'm supporting my, 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 my small bro in college. He was in Mombasa Polytechnic. So the, uh, basically you're living with no money. Yeah. Let me tell you the stress that I used to feel. I used to shake in my room. I used to shake in my room. I'm wondering, oh my God, where am I going to get my orders? Where am I going to get the last money? Rent is uh, in the near, I mean, like in, in a week's time, I'm supposed to pay rent. That time I was paying rent of only 4,500, but it was a whole mountain. No, I, I couldn't see where I would get, I would get that kind of money. But I continued doing. I remember one thing my, where I used to work at, at Elder Weddings. My bosses taught me one thing. They told me, Nora, you must have flash, you have, must have business cards and flash them at any given point. Do not keep quiet. So I had learned that thing when I was in Elder Weddings because I used to do a lot of marketing. I tell people what, what. So what I did, I went and made my Fable Creations uh, business cards. But even speaking out when I'm in a matatu, even telling my neighbor that um, this is, I do deco or I do, I teach what it used to be so hard for me, but I had to do it. So I used to overcome, I, I had to overcome that fear. I had to overcome that anxiety of what will people say, what is going to happen. So I, I flashed out my business card, wherever I go to the bank, to the ATM, wherever, not to the, that time there's no going to the bank. Wherever I go to, to meet clients, wherever I am in the matatu or I go to the shop, I used to visit churches. I think there's no church in Mombasa that I had never gone to. I used to go to churches to look for orders for, for decorations. And I remember there's one church now that gave me an opportunity. I met a lady called Lucy. Mm. In, uh, in, in, uh, she's called Lillian in St. Luke's, Makupa. That girl, may God bless her for me. She believed in me and she gave me an opportunity. She told me there's a wedding coming here soon. So let me give you contacts of these people. You talk to them so they see if they can give you a job. I was so humbled by that gesture. Actually, the people agreed and they gave me a job. And you know how much I quoted? Mm -hmm. How much guests? You know, that time, hey, everyone was doing weddings of 25,000, 30,000. Hey, you know, even doing 50,000 weddings at that time for us who are beginning. It was a miracle. So I quoted 25,000 and they gave me a job. That was quite a big deal. <laughs> Afterwards, did. did you feel the guilt you could have said 50,000? No, I didn't. Mm. I didn't feel the guilt because I, I appreciated my journey. I appreciated yeah. my journey because I didn't know better. You know, if you don't know anything better, then you wouldn't know if there's any other opportunity. And also, I appreciated the fact that people even would embrace my, 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 my design and my art even at that lower level. Because, um, at that time, there was no big, the, the exposure about decoration was not that much. The internet had not opened up all these apps that we have and the, the technology that is there. Mm. So that is how I began with getting small jobs of 30,000 here, then progressing to 50,000 there and everything. And here we are today. Yes. So what made you change the name to Z2 Events? Now, I continue doing my work. Um, at some point, did I tell you that <laughs> at some point I lost hope because there's no business coming in. Business was very low. You see, when we are beginning, there are those challenges that we call startup challenges. Yeah. Number one, um, because you don't know, your networks are not, are, not, are not spread out so much. You don't get a lot of work coming in. You're also in the learning stages. You don't know how to quote. You don't know how to do this. In fact, I usually tell the ladies or the, the people who are doing deco right now, the young people who are doing deco right now, I told them, I usually tell them, you people started at a place where we have made a platform for you. Mm -hmm. You can get in, you can even actually come to, most of them come to me for advice. At that time when we were starting, I didn't know who to even go to. 
-hmm. So you work with what you said, whatever your ideas are, no matter how crude they are, that is what you're going to, yeah, your small exposure, that is, that is what you're going to work with. So I remember at that time, I had already begun business. Things were working out. At least I, w I would not say that I was even breaking even. I was not yet breaking even, but I was now a little at a little bit higher place in a place where uh, I would say I can get a call. I can get a call from here and there. I do a job and I deliver. And then mm. also another challenge that I had, I was doing too many things at the same time. I used to do interior furnishing. I also used to do events, <clears throat> events decoration. Um, it reached a point I had to drop off doing clothing. And this was because there's a time I reached, I was, uh, I was asking God, God, what, 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 what will you need me to do? Exactly. Give me an exact thing that I would do and so that I can pursue it to the full. I remember a small still voice used to tell me, Nora, drop off clothes and pursue events as your main and interior design and interiors furnishings as your minor. But guess what? I used to love stitching clothes. I used to love fashion more than any of this. So actually for me, doing events and all these other interior stuff mm. was was uh, the minor for me. My major was actually clothes, hot yeah. couture, you know, making those couture garments, African wear and, and, and uh, if, uh, gowns for, for events. But now here, God is guiding me to, to drop off uh, clothing and to pursue events as my main and interior as my minor. Remember, events is something that I taught myself after college. And <clears throat> interior is what I learned also in college. So it was it was a push and pull for me, but I obeyed that voice. And I started pursuing fully events. And so I used to balance between events and interiors, events and interiors. So in 2012, <clears throat> I met a lady. She had just resigned her job at KCB, and she was also interested in doing events. I had not registered Fable Creations. So we were like, we were so psyched up. There was a show coming, coming up soon. And we, mm. we went and vouched for a lot of jobs. We got a lot of jobs there, decorating those boots. I think that is the year I did a lot of boots and I have never done so many boots like that again. <clears throat> and we went and did a lot of jobs and everything. We got a lot of money. And of course, we invested a lot of money in also in doing those jobs. And after that, we decided, no. Let us register our own company. Because at that time, you would be asked for an HR machine receipt. You don't have, you have to ask for someone else to give you. So we decided to register the two events as a partnership. We worked with her for a, a, a few events and then also she, she dropped off the partnership and then I continued mm. up to too late. Yes. So that's where you got that the name Z2 events. events. Yes, in 2012. All right. Yes. Now, um, I understand you're married. Yes. So what is it like to be a wife and a businesswoman? Okay, I would say that uh, I thank God for my husband, John Stone Mokuhu. He is a very supportive partner. In fact, I usually say in business, if you don't get a supportive partner, you are done. Because most businesses, they usually take, a, they take up a lot of time. And for being a woman, being a woman, now is even harder because you're supposed to be at home also pre uh, preparing, uh, you know, home, your home, uh, cooking, washing and everything. But I thank God for my husband because he's very understanding. He always tells me, Nora, this is job. So where chapa kazi, you know, you go all out and work. So he understands. And also whenever he's available, he fully supports. And actually, <clears throat> he invests into the business. Okay. He invests into the business because he believes in our in my vision, and he's a major shareholder in my business. So, I've been able to balance. I've been able to balance uh, those those uh, uh, responsibilities of being a wife when I am not at work. When I'm not at work, I am a I'm a housemaker. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, when I'm not at work, I'm a housemaker. I, I do my own laundry. I cook for him. I do my I do my homekeeping. Yes, that is what I do. Yeah, but that uh, but now I I put on both hats at the same time. When I'm out in the field working, I have this hat. But again, with all due humility, I think for me is knowing the, my place in my marriage. I've never at one point demeaned my husband. You know, sometimes you hear because I got married even after I had already started Z2 events. Yeah. So when he was coming in, he, he didn't come in like now he's to, to, to actually make me start the business. Yeah. I was doing my business and I was an independent lady. <clears throat> it is a challenge. Of course, at first it was a challenge 
because uh, uh, you see, as an independent woman, at that time, I had to make a lot of decisions autonomously without consulting him. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was one of the challenges that I, I had to work on so that I can be the kind of wife God expects me to be to my husband. I never used to consult him on many things. I used to wake up and just make decisions at the spur of a moment. But him being a quiet person, he would not confront me. Yeah. But I remember one day, I think this one went this went on for some years. I remember one day he told me, babe, if you ask me for permission to do something, would you think I would ask I would not give you? Because I was used to just informing him. So it was like I wake up, uh, I'm planning my, I, I would plan my itinerary, I plan I'm going to Nairobi, I'm going to do this, 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 and then I just inform him, baby, babe, next week I'm going to Nairobi, and I've already booked my <laughs> <laughs> ticket, I'm going. Yeah. Okay, he would let me go, and then one time he asked me, in 2019 I remember, he asked me, um, if, you, uh, if you inform me early enough, do you think I would ask you not to go? I told him, no, why? See, but you always make decisions on your own without without even informing me. Without it's not that I want to, I want you to not to go or to do, but just you know, it's a partnership. Then that's uh, that's yeah. really that is really amazing. Yes. That's really amazing. Yes. So um, I just want to ask a question yes. about the people in your life. Mm -hmm. If you were to be asked, I personally, I have this belief that yes. no man or woman is self-made. Yes. I feel like we are where we are because somebody believed in us. Yes. So if we're just to say top three, yes. uh, not ranking them really, but who are the three most important people that altered the course of your life? They altered the course of your life entirely. And you feel like if you connect the dots going backwards, if it were not them, we could not be having this conversation this morning. Oh. <clears throat> okay. I know you did mention a few yes. uh, while uh, you were sharing your story, but now this is kind of going a little bit deep into it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I don't know if you have any um, okay. that you would like to I share. Think I think for me, it is, uh, I would say each person that God has brought into my life was for a reason. But um, number one, I would say, I would mention God. Because if it were not for God, I would not have been here. That is one thing for sure. Mm -hmm. I always tell people I rely on God 100%. If you remove God from my equation, then I am not anything. Number two, there is this drive that is inside of me. I always feel I deserve better. I, I, I want better. And this is what I want. So the other person I would mention, I think it would be myself. Because yes. when I began business, nobody believed in me. When I was resigning, I remember that day it was on a Wednesday. I was not able to call even my father because I knew he would tell me no. <laughs> he would tell me no. Because, you know, how, how can you resign from a permanent job? Yeah. You know, all my relatives, nobody would have allowed me to resign if I informed them. So when I resigned, that's when I informed them. And it was not easy because most of them thought I have lost my mind and everything. But I thank God. <clears throat> I thank God uh, that, you know, when, when, once you decide on something, you just decide to pursue it. And when you have the backing of God, that is enough. It was not easy. Here we have just outlined just in a nutshell, but it was the journey was very tough. The journey was very tough. I would say one thing for sure that I began with nothing. Mm -hmm. When I say I began with nothing, I did not have any financial backing from anyone. Not even anyone. I only had a sewing machine and the order that was ongoing that, that, that time. So I began the, 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 the business with myself and the order and God. But I would say um, there are people I met, they used to challenge me a lot. There's a friend I had met, he used to have his own business. I used to admire how he operates, how he makes decisions, how he pushes things to do. So those are the people who used to to make me feel like I can be like them, I can be better than them, I can be more than them, you know. Mm. So it is a conglomerate of many people 
not necessarily one specific person. I yeah. would say that they inspired me a lot. So I thank God even for the ladies who gave me an opportunity. My bosses, Phyllis and Susan. Yeah. I think also they were in the path of destiny to lead me, to guide me to knowing how to, to operate a business. Because right now, I always reap from the faithfulness that I, I, I invested. I always tell my workers, you know, you can be in a place, you can work somewhere and not even take a single coin from that business. And you live, you, because I was used, I used to be paid 8,000 shillings every month. I had the house to pay, I had fare and everything. But yet, they would give me their money, their ATM, to go withdraw money for business. Even sometimes to buy stocks even of what? 200,000, and yet in the accounts I could see they have even almost a million, and I would not even withdraw even extra. If my allowance that time, maybe they tell me it's only a thousand, but I would not get any extra, and I would account for every, <coughs> sorry, for every single point. Yeah. So even now, when I have my workers, everyone who works for me, I tell them, be faithful wherever you work. You can be where you can work and not steal even a single point from your company, mm -hmm. and God will bless you. You'll see the blessings of it. Yeah. Uh, and just to add on that, I thank God when I started the business, I had people who believed in my dream. I had people who believed in me, my art. I remember uh, even my aunties, my relatives, they used to give me jobs. My friends used to give me orders. <clears throat> my friends used to give me orders to work on. That's all that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... Apart from Z2 events, mm -hmm. what other things that are you interested in that you find yourself doing? I can see that there are some books here. Yeah. Yes. I'm passionate about writing. <clears throat> I love journaling a lot. Sorry. I love journaling a lot. I began journaling when I was young. And profoundly, I think when I was in high school, <clears throat> So as the years go by, go went by, I kept writing on different books and everything. But um, from the year 2020, I, I, I backed this idea of coming up with a journal so that it can help the people who love to write every day <clears throat> and just put their, their ideas or their feelings into the books. So my first journal was... Uh, Simply grateful. This is a gratitude journal. Actually, to if someone loves to to give thanks, in a way of writing, this is a, a tool that I came up with, whereby someone writes every day what they are grateful for, and then it also has a part where someone can write their today's goals, and also self love notes. You know, you tell yourself how much you love yourself. You can write your reflections and what you learned in the day. So all these are under Teach Bits for Life. Teach Bits for Life is a page on Facebook that um, I used to write a lot on my thoughts. And sometimes I would post not necessarily my own uh, writings. I would post things that would resonate with what I'm going through. And then after some time, I think in 2020, 2021, I launched this uh, Simply Grateful journal. Then in 20. 2022, I came up with this uh, Someone Notebook, the Someone Notebook, and also the Devotional Journal. These are for people who love to do Bible study and write their prayer requests. And the Someone Notebook is a notebook where you write down your someone when you go to church or you're listening to a preaching. Yeah. Then this year, the year 2023, I came up with uh, a daily planner. This daily planner has no time limit. It has no year. So it is a planner that you can actually buy today and start using it. And then you get another one. You need, when you're done with it, you get another one. So this one helps you to plan for your day. Uh, it has a daily mantra written, live a day at a time. It has a place for date and day your daily schedules, your top priorities, only just have three top priorities for the day, and then your to-do list. And then here, yeah, you can even write your meals. If you're a person who is keen about your meal intake and your water intake and you're working out. And then there's a place here for writing uh, your mood, what, you, what are you grateful for and what are the goals for tomorrow. This is an area where you can even write in the evening as you're reflecting on how the day was. So this is a beautiful tool. 
that helps someone plan their day. And then uh, behind each page, there's a place where you can write notes. You know, for us who love to write, we never miss something to write every day, maybe what you paid. You can write like, like a journal also. You just put in what are your thoughts for the day. So that is it. These uh, daily planners, they go for 850 shillings. The Simply Gratitude Journals usually comes in. This is how it is put in. This is the version for men. <laughs> and uh, for men, eh? men who are men, not men who are female. And then this is a, a version for the women, females, yes, in ladies. Yeah. It comes with a beautiful, beautiful bookmark. I love, I, I think I love uh, writing and small, small things. And then also it is accompanied with a simply grateful pen, which you use it as your journaling. And then the book is well partitioned inside. They, they are inspirational quotes that I had uh, written. I don't know if I can find them with ease. Eh? Yeah. Like there's a quote here written, um, gratitude attracts favor and goodwill. And then the signed Nora Zige. Yeah, so like we have partitioned them three times in the book. So this is a tool that can help you cultivate your gratitude and so that you can live a more grateful life. Because you see nowadays there's a lot of um, anxieties. People are facing a lot of anxieties. People are facing a lot of trauma. Mm. and healed trauma and, and just pressures of life. So if you're a person who loves to write, this is very nice. It helps you diffuse your thoughts into it. Yeah. All right. So uh, Nora, it has been amazing hosting you. And you. just before we roll the sleeves, is yeah. that what they say? Uh -huh. um, let me know which camera to use uh, for Nora. Nora, here. So you can look straight to the camera and inspire us. You know, what is your parting shot when all is said and done? What is it that you would like people to learn from your story? Um, one thing I would like people to learn from my story is that um, do not remove God from the equation. Do not remove God from the equation. No one is self-made. And no one is made by people alone. God is the ultimate maker. Um, when, we, when we see some of us, like when I've come here, I'm only presenting to you what you can see. But there is the behind the story, there is the process. There is the process for reaching this place. And in that process, if God was not in the equation, I think I would have lost my mind. Sometimes I share with my friends and some people, I tell them, um, if... God was not in my equation. Right now, maybe I would be back home disturbing my father and crying depressed and raggedy, you know, and maybe I would even have lost my mind because what was against me, what the pressure of life was so high. You know, sometimes we deal with a lot of things. There are those unhealed traumas. There are those things that uh, they, they, they come, life throws you lemons. And so you have to decide, are you going to, 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 to cry or are you going to rise up from those ashes, from those lemon situations and turn the lemon into lemonade? So it is up to you to decide. But whatever you decide, make sure that you, re you don't remove God from the equation because God is more than able to turn things around for your life. Even for my business, for my aspirations, for my ministry, I always rely on God. For everything, yes. Well, that is that has been powerful. It has been a great honor to host you, Nora. Thank you so and much. Personally, I am inspired. Okay. But today, I was having a conversation with you. Yes. I can't wait yes. to now sit down yes. and watch your video. Thank you. So and much. then after that, mm -hmm. sit down and reflect. Mm -hmm. Sit down and reflect and ask myself, mm -hmm. where have I come from? Yeah. What are the things that I've gone through? Mm -hmm. Where am I today? Mm -hmm. And where am I headed? Mm -hmm. And then ask myself the most important question. Mm -hmm. What do I need to drop mm -hmm. 
yeah. in order for me to reach yes. where I am supposed to go? Yes. And what do I need to pick up mm -hmm. in order for me to have an amazing journey yes. to where I am going? Mm -hmm. And what are the things that I need to continue doing yes. with excellence so mm -hmm. that I am able mm -hmm. to reach the destination that mm -hmm. I am going? Yes. And that is what we bring you at Stories of Significance. Mm -hmm. We bring you personal, authentic stories that will provoke our perspectives, you know, inspire us, and stories that we can connect with, yes. and then we can be able to transform our lives one day at, at a time, time. Yes. one action at a time, time. one attitude at, at a time. time, one habit at, at a time. time. Till yes. next time, over and out. Thank you.